So, um, yeah, thanks, everybody. My name is Sue Kilroy. I'm the director of the Nursing Sim Lab at Temple University within the College of Public Health. And I'm here today with my friends and colleagues to um, present our program called the Patient Voices Program. And so I'm here with Blaze Brown, Beth Marks, and Bridget Brown. And this project originated at the Schwartz Simulation Lab at UIC College of Nursing. So it, it really is a beautiful place. So if you ever have a chance, I would definitely recommend to uh, tour, take a tour. Um, okay. So I thought today we would talk about the, I'm gonna talk about the background and development of the program. Um, then I'm gonna turn it over to Blaze. who's gonna talk about the research, the implementation and the results of the program. And last but not least, we're gonna turn it over to Bridget, who's gonna talk about her experience as, a, as an SP or a simulated patient. So starting with the background, just so you know, UIC has approximately 34,000 uh, students. It has seven health science colleges. Um, IPE is an essential or an accreditation requirement for multiple colleges. Um, UIC also has a very robust IPE steering committee and their mission is to create transformational change in health professions, education and healthcare service delivery by delivering evidence-based learning experiences that build collaborative competence. So right now they have a, a great foundations course that's been running for years. It serves over 1300 students from 13 different professions. And what that course does, it evaluates their attitudes and perceptions towards collaborative practice. Um, and so our team was thinking about the next level, like looking at behaviors. So that's where the simulation lab came up. And so to develop a second level IPE course. Um, and our goal is to measure and evaluate interprofessional behaviors and perceptions, even if they're self-reported. Um, and so this, this program builds off the foundations course. And like I said, it started in the Schwartz lab and the team used best practices through SSH, which is the Society for Simulation in Healthcare and Naxal and ASPE when we were developing the program. So just to give you, this is a broad overview to give you a timeline. So in the fall of 2020, um, through the IPE steering committee, I met Blaze and uh, working with him, he always wanted to develop a pro program where students can lear learn with and from individuals with disabilities. And I always talked about developing an interprofessional sim. So he called me one day and he's like, Sue, can I come tour your lab? I'm like, sure. And then we, he came up with a good idea of let's just combine our two projects. So that's basically where it started. Um, in the spring and the summer of 2021, through Valerie Gruss and Blaze, we met with the disability department and that's where Beth Marks came on board. And we also were able to um, meet community collaborators, which were also very important to the program. In the fall 2021, uh, 2022 winter, we applied for funding and IRB approval. We um, got funding through the IPE steering committee at UIC and also funding through two Faculty Catalyst Awards. Um, in the spring and the summer of 2022, we recruited and trained our facilitators and SPs. All our SPs were interviewed over um, Zoom and then they were um, brought onto the project. And then in the fall of 2022 is where we implemented the first um, program and it was ran over nine weeks and included nurse, nurse practitioner, dentists and uh, pharmacy students. So that gives you like an overall picture. I'm just gonna drill down a little bit now. Um, so one of the things we did was start with the why, why this was so important. And if you look in the literature, a survey of United States ADA physicians practicing in the outpatient setting reported the following, 71% lack knowledge as to who determines the need needed accommodation, 68% felt at risk for ADA lawsuits, 36% had little or no knowledge about legal responsibilities, and 21% did not know who pays for uh, care. Um, and then also we thought it was really important that including um, people with disabilities as SPs can prepare a new generation of clinical professionals to offer the highest level of care, have an outward purpose that includes caring for marginalized patient um, populations. Um, and another thing we talked a lot about in the development was stimulated patients with uh, disabilities because it highlights the need for patient provider concordance and healthcare delivery to improve outcomes. It improves quality healthcare inclusive of disability and cultural competency. It also can re redesign environments and structures beyond individual healthcare practices 
to support diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility of all patients. And last but certainly not least, it was identified as a gap in our healthcare profession curriculum. Um, we, we realized across multiple professions, students didn't have the opportunity to work with or learn from individuals with disabilities. So that was another important part. Um, so now I'm gonna kind of move into the logistics and talk about the faculty and SIM staff, the simulated patients and the students per, uh, logistics. And I just, um, for anybody who's thinking about implementing this, I always remember this quote from Martin Luther King is, you know, always take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole uh, staircase, just take the first step because there were a lot of meetings where we were like, where's the funding coming from? Or where are we going to find these actors? Or a lot of unknown questions, but we just kept meeting and, and things kind of fell in place. So the logistics for this faculty and SIM team, um, we trained simulated patients to two oral health medication centric cases. We recruited and scheduled students from our DMP pharmacy and dentistry programs. We scheduled students and simulated patients over a nine week period. Facilitators completed IDD and debriefing training before they signed up to be facilitators. And then we implemented simulations both in person and for telehealth. Um, so here is our wonderful interprofessional team. I wish I had time to talk about each and every person, but just so you know, there's faculty from dentistry, from pharmacy, from nursing, faculty from our disabilities office, our SIM team and our SP educators up there, and then two community um, members who we hired as healthcare coaches, which I will uh, talk about a little later. But the program would have never run without all these wonderful people because it was a lot of moving pieces. Um, the other thing that faculty did before we developed two um, simulate, simulation cases, and they're medication-centric oral health cases. And so case one presented a 21-year-old patient with a disability who came to the primary care uh, clinic complaining of prolonged episodes of pain to the face and jaw. The diagnosis include trigeminal neuralgia, depression, and GERD. In case two was a 20-year-old patient who had access to care and financial challenges with a complicated home life, also had poor follow-up to medical care. They presented to the clinic with bleeding gums, and the diagnosis include um, gingivitis, hypoplasia, and generalized seizure disorder. So each um, student, uh, actors were put into one or two groups and learned only one case so they could really hone their skills. Um, so moving to our simulated patients, here's some of our uh, wonderful actors that took um, part in the program. So thinking about their logistics, uh, first we developed collaborations with UIC Theater Department and UIC Office of Disabilities. We recruited the SPs from both groups. Um, we trained SPs through in-person workshops and Zoom meetings. We had one-on-one -on -one training with our SP trainer, scheduled SPs over a nine week period, and then we would meet with the SPs for constructive feedback um, and finally submit invoices and um, payments. Uh, so there's some of our SPs who are also still in the program this year. They're still working in the project this year too. Um, and I know I talked a little bit about the workshop. The initial summer we had three in-person, we have had both in-person and telehealth workshops. Um, and on the, I'm not going to read this whole table. It's a lot of information, but I'll just give you a couple examples. So like one workshop objective was to promote team building. And we did this through an activity called theater games. And the rationale is playing games enables the participants to experiment and discover in a relaxed, enjoyable atmosphere without pressure. Another one is uh, objective was to demonstrate realistic pain depiction. Um, the activity was technique exercise. And the rationale was to help with realistic pain depiction while protecting the SP from um, any personal trigger. Another example is demonstrate realism. Um, that was done through one-on-one -on -one rehearsals, and that enables the trainer to know correction and adjust patient depiction. And I, and I just want to say before I leave the screen, um, we had a wonderful SP educator, Chris Karsmar, who did a really great job of getting the actors where they needed to be. Um, he was also really great about reaching out to faculty after um, the, the simulation day and saying things like, how did your day go? And if we gave any constructive feedback, he would uh, reach out to the actors and um, coach them to where they needed to be. So he was a really important part of this project. 
Um, and then thinking about the logistics for the students, uh, what the students did was they completed the IPEC set 27. Um, they completed IDD curriculum and online modules. Then they attended the simulations and debriefings. And then they, after that, they completed a post IPEC set 27. And um, the, you can see in the little red square, we, the first year we used intellectability curriculum in ID healthcare. And you can see there were six modules, everything from IDD basics all the way down to bringing it all together um, and case studies in IDD healthcare. So the other thing I wanna say about the students, um, the nurse practitioner students got credit for this day. They got project hours, up to 10 project hours. The dentistry and pharmacy students substituted a clinical day to come to this project. So thinking about implementation, it was implemented over a nine week period. We ran 108 simulations. That includes, we had a telehealth branch and an in-person simulation branch. Uh, 68 students completed the program. We utilized interprofessional teams that was seven facilitators, two health care coaches, and 15 sim simulated patients. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the healthcare coaches. They were um, members from the community. One was a social worker and one was um, a theater advocate. And the reason we uh, brought them on, and you can see in the uh, picture there, one of our health coaches is there with Bridget. Um, because thinking about the SPs, both groups, the theater students and the individuals with disabilities are considered vulnerable population. So we wanted to make sure if there was ever a scenario where they didn't feel comfortable coming to me, the actors and asking something or saying something or to Blaze or to anybody who was running the program, they had an advocate, especially for them. So that was their one role. And then their other role was they learn all the cases. So if an actor came to us and said, you know, I really want support during my simulation case, we could embed the um, healthcare coach in the case. And they, a lot of times they played the cousin of the patient, you know, come into the appointment with them or the person that worked at the SILA or the group home. So um, they were they were a wonderful asset to this project too, and they really supported the actors um, throughout the project. So now I will turn it over to Blaze and uh, I'll let him take it away. Let me unmute myself. Thank you, uh, Sue. Before I, I start going through this, I uh, just uh, a comment I'd, I'd like to make. Um, you know, when I was thinking about doing this project, and and it's far outside any of my responsibilities that I have at the College of Dentistry here at UIC, um, this really became, um, I've been here 19 years and probably the uh, most significant thing I think I've ever done. Um, you know, so um, uh, I'm, I'm really excited that it's continuing. Um, and uh, Sue actually made this a lot easier than it really was <laughs> for me. So. <laughs> Anyway, so um, we did it. It uh, we did have an IRB. It was a a research project, um, and we wanted to uh, in the purpose to really look at the influence of primary care uh, simulation experiment uh, experiences with simulated patients who were portraying patients in underserved or vulnerable communities, um, and then look at the healthcare professionals, uh, students' uh, self efficacy for collaborative practice behaviors. Um, and we did this, as Sue already said, uh, with uh, dental students, pharmacy students, and nurse practitioners. And we also explored their perceptions um, and, and even their feelings about caring for individuals from underserved communities. Uh, our design for the study was a mixed method uh, uh, design, uh, typical with, with, with many um, uh, IPE uh, studies. Uh, we use the IPEC set 27, which is a validated instrument. Um, and then we recorded our debriefing sessions and went through uh, each of those recordings uh, to uh, extract uh, data. Uh, next slide, please. So this was about interprofessional education, and um, you know the idea of uh, here here at the university. Um, we, as Sue mentioned, we all have these as accreditation um, requirements, but they're also an exciting part of where healthcare is going. 
point, and we're really hoping that we're going to change our healthcare system by doing this uh, at the educational level. So the idea of, of interprofessional collaboration is creating teams um, and not just improving health outcomes, but really addressing everything on the quintuple aim. Next slide, please. So with uh, interprofessional collaboration, the idea is we're going to yield better health services, uh, better outcomes for populations. We're also going to be able to address the needs of populations that uh, oftentimes have not had their health care uh, needs met. Um, and collaboration occurs when students uh, learn about each other and they have respect for one another. Uh, and each other's professions, um, and they're willing to do this in a, in a cooperative atmosphere. Um, and doing this requires purpose. You, you really have to do things on purpose. It doesn't happen just by putting people together. And so our, our design uh, here, which was simulation, um, you know, followed uh, other types of designs that have been done didactically and also in clinical care education. Next slide, please. Um, our theoretical frameworks were uh, working with IPEC competencies. Um, and we measured all four domains of the IPEC, IPEC competencies. Those would be the 2016 IPEC competencies. Um, and that was using the IPEC set survey. Uh, and then we also used PEARLS. Uh, PEARLS was something new for me. Um, and there are five different phases in PEARLS. And I'll tell you what that is in a minute. Um, but an anal uh, emphasis was placed on one part of the pearls, which is the analysis. And this is where students discuss their uh, collaborative practice behaviors, what had happened in, in the simulation, um, how they felt about it. Uh, there, uh, there, there's a, a, a couple of slides I have that I'll address that information. Next slide, please. So these were the sim case learning objectives and they were framed around the uh, IPEC competencies. Um, the focus of our study was really on teamwork and team-based practices, communication practices, um, and roles and responsibility for, for collaborative practices. And that would be the IPEC competencies that uh, are listed under those domains. We also addressed community and population health. And although we didn't have uh, specific competencies from the ethics and values domain, um, as I like to say, in each of these other domains, teams and teamwork, communication, et cetera, that ethics and values was somehow imbued in that um, and came out in our uh, debriefing and analysis. Next slide, please. So here's a, a shot of the simulation lab. Uh, Bridget and I are actually sitting in the sim lab right now over at nursing. Um, I escaped from the dental school. Um, <laughs> And our purpose was to prepare collaborative ready healthcare professionals to care for individuals with disabilities or those from marginalized communities. The design links, as I already said, the IPEC competencies with the collaborative simulation and debriefing using PEARLS and our medication centric cases focused on caring for patients with medical, oral health um, and uh, significant access to care needs. Next slide, please. One reason to think about including um, individuals with disabilities as standardized patients really goes back to the fact that these individuals and as a population face uh, a great disparity in healthcare access and in healthcare quality uh, in our nation and, and actually in most of the world. Um, many people with uh, disabilities or developmental disabilities um, live in poverty. They have high unemployment, um, and all of that. These are these are you know social determinants, and uh, and just those facts are reflected in their lack of access to healthcare. But there's many many other factors, um, disadvantages, and other determinants. Um, there's great inconsistency in the education of cl clinicians about care. Um, as we know from the literature, that there's actually bias and reluctance to care for individuals with disabilities. And perhaps the, the biggest area or, or the most significant disparity when it comes to access and actual uh, care is with oral health. 
with uh, patients who have uh, disabilities. So the idea was really to create the simulation with standardized patient actors um, who had disabilities or were from marginalized communities as a way of getting our students to just have another experience um, interacting, talking, uh, learning about communication, um, learning about themselves, uh, seeing how a team can interact with, with patients who, who typically they might not have a lot of interaction with in their educational programs um, here at UIC. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the PEARLS, the, the debriefing tool that we used uh, following the, the actual simulation itself. Uh, PEARLS stands for Promoting Excellence and Reflective Learning in Simulation. And, and I have to say, I really like the, the PEARLS model, um, since I did say it was new for me. Um, you go through PEARLS and you set the scene, you check for the reactions and sometimes the emotional reactions of the participants. Um, there's the description, which oftentimes is the, the diagnosis, or a, uh, you're, you're, you, ask, you ask the students to uh, re review the entire case, an analysis is done. Then there's uh, application and summary. You, uh, you try to link this with the IPAC competencies while you're doing it. Um, and in the end, Focusing in the in the uh, debriefing process, uh, with using specific questions and, and and in some ways kind of ad living as as, as a facilitator and, and trying to see um, where students were going in terms of their thoughts about caring for uh, individuals from underserved populations and what their perceptions were. Next slide, please. So this is just kind of uh, uh, showing the entire debriefing tool um, and, and, and the five different parts of it. Uh, if you look over in the right-hand column, um, and uh, Sue had put a couple of nice comments and questions that all of the facilitators used. Um, so like under reactions, we would ask, how are you feeling? Or is there one word that can describe how you're feeling uh, uh, following this uh, um, simulation. And this would be done between the facilitator, the students, and the standardized patient, or if there was a support person, the standardized patient with a support person. Um, and so it was really a, a wonderful way to, to, to look at, at what was done and to start probing into uh, what students were learning, how they were feeling about this, um, and really set the stage nicely for the rest of, of the feedback session. Um, next slide, please. So um, we recruited students. It was a convenient sampling, uh, that's for sure. Um, and there was something very pragmatic about that. Um, and that was really the only way we could get students. Um, so our, our students were uh, typically um, in, uh, well, we had students enrolled in years one through four of the doctor of nursing program, dentistry, or pharmacy. Most of our students were at or close to the end of their program. Um, the survey data collection occurred over about a nine week period um, using electronic methods. Uh, we had a baseline self-efficacy uh, for collaborative practice that using the IPEC set 27 to measure the participants um, self-efficacy for competence and collaborative practice behaviors. They would do that prior to starting the SIM. And then at the uh, conclusion of the sim, when they had uh, finished the entire uh, uh, session, uh, they also then went back and uh, did the IPEC set 27 for a post experience uh, data collection. Next slide, please. Uh, there were statistically significant improvement in mean uh, collaborative practice behavior scores uh, demonstrated by all of the professions for all 27 items immediately after the IPE simulation experience. So that was pretty significant. The greatest mean change was seen in the teamwork item. So that would be in that IPEC competency. And we have uh, the, uh, the mean and standard deviation before and after here. Um, and this would, then we also had qualitative responses, um, which when we went through all of the recordings, we were uh, categorizing them according to oh. um, 
IPEC competencies. Uh, in this case, we're showing describe the process of team development and the roles and practices of effective teams. Um, and so this uh, TT1, as we called it, uh, was uh, the most reported change oh, come in on. practice behaviors. Um, values and ethics was the least reported. Next slide, please. Um, so these are some examples of the of uh, comments that were made by by students uh, during the recording during the debriefing that we um, that we actually extracted from the recordings. Uh, so I'll just go to values and ethics. Uh, this was a statement made by a farm student. I feel that all of us displayed a heightened sense of compassion and empathy, which is extremely important and and made this go really well and still made the patient feel comfortable and wanting to talk to each and every one of us. And I have to say it was state, statements like that as, as particularly going back and listening to the recordings that really gave you a, a sense of how important and how significant this is as an educational tool um, that could be used, uh, I, I think, universally. Uh, next slide, please. So our next steps, uh, which we have started this year, first is to expand to other colleges and universities. So we have Fortunately, have Temple, or unfortunately, because we have Temple because Sue Kilroy left UIC and went <laughs> to Temple. We're still not happy about that, but we're happy for her. Um, we've been uh, at least trying to, to get participation from the UIC College of Medicine. Uh, my own idea was that we will, we will try to get this to all seven healthcare colleges here at UIC and get participation uh, across our entire West Campus. Um, the other part is creating a package, uh, an education package, um, a budget, um, and then uh, that package would also contain facilitator and SP trainings. We did a lot of training on, on, in this project. Um, you know, I failed to mention even with the pearls and the pearls debriefing um, um, model is is we did we did a couple of trainings uh, with that with our facilitators. Um, and in addition to that, we had uh, some articles and uh, uh, literature on the pearls topic that all, all helped to uh, keep our facilitators uh, somewhat consistent in how they approached each SIM feedback session. Next slide, please. Um, and then disseminating uh, the information from the study. Um, uh, we are working on an article right now. Um, so it's going to be published um, last January at the IMESH meeting. That's the International Meeting for Simulation and Healthcare. We presented this project, um, and you can see the, those famous presenters there in that upper left-hand corner. Um, and of course, we're doing this today with uh, with PATH, um, and so that's uh, another hopeful way that we'll be able to disseminate it. Um, because uh, Bridget Bridget Brown is was part of this as a standardized patient actor and is also um, a co-op student um, in the Department of uh, Disability and Human Development here at UIC. Um, she actually had an article about her that uh, appeared in this blog uh, from the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services, which is part of the U.S. Department of Education. Um, you can um, you can Google that and read that. And then also uh, in UIC today, so this would be across uh, our university here at the University of Illinois in Chicago, um, we had an article about the training and the scope of our project last year. Next slide, please. And I'm going to turn this over to Bridget, who has a few comments about her experience as a standardized patient. I, I'm going to talk about the participation. So I felt I was included in the whole project by the nursing, pharmacy, and dental students and the nursing department, Sue Kilroy, Lynn, Katie, and Chris. Students asked good questions to help me as a patient. I understand what was going on. They explained things well for the patient in the case Dana who has disability. They showed me respect and they treated me as someone with ability, 
and not disability. SB training. The training was was good. Chris and Sue did the training. They helped explain the entire project so I could understand it and play my role. Chris helped me a lot with the training and an act and an act and and to be an actor. He shared tools and strategies that help include people like me with disabilities to play the roles given up for us. For example, he gave good training recommendation for providing positive feedback. If I was a patient, a patient I felt like the briefing process. It was good. It was positive building relationships and connections to the student providers. Chris training helped a lot of giving strategies on how to give feedback to students. I felt really good about giving feedback since students listen my ideas and understanding to be to become better. In future recommendations, I continue doing projects like this all over the USA so students can learn to work with patients with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you. So I think that brings us to our end of it. If anybody has any questions, I, I can stop sharing now. Um, and if any if anybody in the group has any questions for any of us, 